must stand for something. It is a Friday night in 1973. My father cuts short his day of dry cleaning, pickups, and deliveries. He walks through our door at exactly 7.30 p.m., brushes the dirt from his shoes, washes his hands, and moseys on over to the lazy boy in the corner of the family room. He would eat late, not wanting to miss any portion of Sanford and Son, his favorite program. This one particular Friday night turns out to be a special surprise for him. Lena Horne is scheduled to make a guest appearance. When she comes into view on the television screen, my father smiles, folds his hands across his pouch, and declares with much vigor, Lena Horne, my, 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 my. My mother bolts from the behind the kitchen counter, soapy dish rag in hand, and joins in. Who, hun? Uh-huh. That woman is something else. Who oh, you should have seen her back in the day. Hearing the excited voices, I stop my sewing to watch this Lena Horn. A half hour later, I do not see what all the fuss is about. This scenario illustrates the proverbial generation gap. But that television episode, as well as her performance as Glenda, the good witch in Sidney Lumet's forgettable film, The Wiz, had introduced Lena Horne to a new generation of young African Americans. My parents' spirited responses, however, later piqued my interest in Horne. What is behind the fuss and the uh-huh? And who is the woman behind the my, 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 my? And what is the something else to Lena Horne? When she became Metro Goldwyn Mayor's first Negro star to sign a long-term contract in 1942, thus commences the dance of my, my, my's and uh-huh's from the theater-going public. In the words of song stylist Nancy Wilson, she said, Lena had it all. She had the walk, the talk, the look. She was able to be everything that anybody, white or black, would have wanted to be. Horn's image, her hourglass figure, light skin, European facial features, and straight textured hair counters the image of Hattie McDaniel, the rotund blue-black maid, the premier black star of the 1930s. Moreover, as the first Negro actress afforded on-screen glamour, she takes her place alongside the major white female stars, namely Ava Gardner, Lana Turner, Hedy Lamar, and Veronica Lake. She had it all, and Walter White, the NAACP representative, believes in her ability to perform the dance of symbol of Negro racial uplift via the silver, the silver screen. Journalist Frank Nugent notes in 1945, Horn's loyalty to her race made her almost a symbol to the new generation of Negroes, many of whom referred to her publicly as a feminine Paul Robeson. This symbol for racial uplift bolsters the something else of Lena Horn. The symbol is a societal em emblem a particular individual agrees to assume in the interest of the community. The community invests its hopes and dreams in an emblem individual hoping for social political change. In times of crisis, a symbol or heroine arises out of the Negro community to undertake a perilous journey, yet momentous journey, to lead the masses out of oppression and into a fight for social justice. We have seen these symbols in the leadership of other women in the political arena. Anna Julia Cooper, Mary Church Terrell, and Harriet McLeod Bethune, to name a few. When Horne signs the long-term contract with MGM, she becomes the symbolic figure to lead Negro womanhood from behind the apron of the cinematic mammy and into new roles. Horne's autobiographies in person, published in 1950, and Lena, by Lena Horne and Richard Schickel in 1965 revealed, however, that the contract with MGM activates several personal and professional concerns. First, the document launches Horne on a quest to deem herself worthy of the gift of being the first Negro woman to become a major contract player within the Hollywood studio system. 
attended to the question of worthiness, porn experiences, and interior discomfort as she wrestles with the guilt of displacing her on-screen Negro predecessor, Hattie McDaniel. Secondly and finally, as a Negro performer, Horn works to discover a new meaning for the star and the symbol. These components of popular culture have to signify more than mere spectacle for the enjoyment of the masses if she is to assume the role at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Horn's quest then is not a simple search for acceptance from her colleagues, no. It is also a pursuit of an understanding of the symbol as it is mapped onto the body of the Negro actress in times of national trauma. Discomfort and anxiety attend Horn's representation within the Hollywood community. Horn decides to enter in 1942. Horn's signature on the MGM contract causes a conflict within the old guard community of West Coast Negro actors many of whom considers the Eastern upstart a menace to their economic stability. Because Horn, they found Horn in Cafe Society in, in uh, New York. She was part of the Cotton Club. And so Walter White brings her from the East Coast to the West Coast, and all hell breaks loose. This West Coast, East Coast rivalry results in a protest meeting that assembles at the home of none other than Hattie McDaniel to discuss the impending shift and attitudes towards the roles they have made popular. Chief among the concerns is that if Horn or Walter White's guinea pig and Walter White as spokesperson for the NAACP antagonize the status quo and displace the so-called menial roles, the financial status of the actors casting those roles will be threatened. McDaniel maintains that if Mammy draws such indign indignation from the NAACP and White, then the institution and its representatives should find her a different role. She says, what do you want me to do? Play a glamour girl and sit on Clark Gable's knee? When you ask me not to play the parts, what have you got to offer in return? For instance, McDaniel earns 2000 a week, and Willie Best earns 600 a week by the time White arrives in Hollywood to rally for Horn. Lincoln, Theodore, Monroe, Andrew Perry, or Stephen Fetchett, um, and Bill Bojangles Robinson and McDaniel live the Hollywood high style on the money garnered from their screen portrayal. Stephen Fetcher was a millionaire twice over, and so was, well, all of them were. McDaniel, uh, Hattie McDaniels was too. Um, each of these actors works on contract, but not long term contracts. The pre horn elite Negro actors' contracts are for terms of no more than six months with options that could be dropped at the whim of the studio. Others are bit players working for a few dollars a day, a box lunch, and bus fare. Horn stands in the midst of this conflict, literally, and it is within the context of protest that Horn begins her journey to find meaning for the symbol. As a first strategy, Horn projects her voice into the chaos in order to dispel her fellow actors' suspicion and to gain their acceptance. During the protest meeting, she is forced to get up and try to explain that she was not trying to start a revolt or steal work from anyone and that the NAACP was not using her for any ulterior purpose. Horn's voice is a clarion call to the Negro old guard to understand the cultural implications of her contract. It is also the proverbial cry in the wilderness of one seeking to be anointed by her own people for the journey to come. Audrey Lord instructs us to listen. She says, where the words of women are crying out to be heard, we each must recognize our responsibility to seek those words out, to read them and share them and examine them to the pertinence to, their, to our lives. Only when this happens can the symbol for racial uplift fully assume the burden of representation. The matriarch of cinematic Negro womanhood, McDaniel, answers Horn's call for support. Horn remembers. McDaniel called me up and asked me to visit her. I went to her beautiful home, and she explained how difficult it had been for Negroes in the movies, which helped give me some perspective on the whole situation. She sympathized with my position and thought it was the right one if I chose it. Miss, Miss McDaniel's act of grace helped me tie over a very awkward and difficult moment. <laughs> 